We're going to be in Genesis chapter 9, and hopefully we'll go all the way over to Genesis 11 today. I've been wanting to get out of the kind of prehistoric section and get into uh, the life of Abraham, which we put a little bit better date on than where we are now. But there's a couple more things that I think are important enough for us to take a look at. And uh, we're going to start in chapter 9, verse 18. Yeah, that's where I want to be, chapter 9, verse 18. And I want us to just read down through the end of the chapter and talk about what's commonly called the curse of Canaan or the curse of Ham. And a couple of things that I've been thinking about this week and some reading that I did kind of changed my mind on a little bit. But anyway, I just want to kind of get us uh, into that mindset. And before we do, let me remind us who, was, who were the original people to get this document. And I know I'm harping on that, but this document was written to, given to, the children of Israel who were just coming up out of Egypt. They were trying to find their identity as a nation. And so passages like this need to be understood in terms of what an Israelite in the desert, trying to get to know this new God who brought them up out of Egypt, trying to understand what's going on with Moses, all of those things were their, that was their world. And into that world comes this information. And there were so many things that God could have told them. Why does he tell them this? Okay, So just put that question in your mind as we get into the text. And then I'll try to maybe unfold some of it uh, as it makes sense to me anyway. And maybe it will make sense to you as well. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. They walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will will he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. So we we can set Noah aside. And again, notice the the length of his life, right? 950 years, and we'll bring that back up here in a little bit if we get to it. Noah is a man of the soil. That should remind us of at least a couple of people that we've already met. Uh, When Adam was created, God put him on the the planet and he said, take care of the garden. That was Adam's place in the world. Adam had a son uh, who was a keeper of the fields, Cain. And so Cain was another one that was very involved in farming, in keeping plants. Uh, Both of them had problems because of sinful things that they did with the earth not giving them its abundance, right? For Adam it was the earth is going to bring forth uh, weeds and tares. For Cain it was the earth is no longer going to give you of its bounty. When Noah comes into the world, his daddy prophesies and says, this is the one who's going to reverse the curse. So when Noah gets off of the ark... He plants a vineyard, and the vineyard comes in well. He gets a good return on his planting of this vineyard. This is the first time we know of alcohol. 
in the scriptures. First time we know of anybody planting a vineyard or drinking from the wine of a vineyard. And what's the outcome? So there you go. Preach, preach your own sermon on that one. I don't even have to go there. So he is a man of the soil. And he's a little bit like God in this sense in that he's the one who puts in place the garden. Right? Noah gets off of the ship and he plants a garden. Shem and Japheth are a little bit godlike because they cover the nakedness. So we have some of the themes that we've already seen in the first two or three chapters of Genesis kind of show back up in humans rather than in God acting them out. The humans do things that are a little bit godlike. The question comes in when we look at the crime and the punishment. Okay? Look back at verse 24. In verse 24 it says, When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. All right, we'll, we'll get back to it. But who was the youngest? It seems to have been Ham that is the offender. It's Canaan who is Ham's son who's going to be cursed. But in every list of the sons of Noah, they're listed Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Right? So that uh, Shem being the oldest, Ham being the middle child, and Japheth being the youngest. And I looked at every single list, and every single list has it the same. When you get to chapter 10, there is a list of the descendants of each one, and they go backwards. They go Japheth, Ham, Shem. So that the Shemites, or those who are out in the desert getting all this information, they get the last bit of information. Who are, who are your distant cousins? Who are your other distant cousins? Well, who are you? Okay, so they, they get the last little bit in chapter 10. And again, we'll try to get to that here in just a little bit. So the, the individual I was reading this week, that, that at first I went, well, that's not right. And the more I read him, the more I liked what he was saying was that in verse 24... We're not necessarily seeing uh, Noah waking up and saying, well, look what Ham did to me. He wakes up and he sees what Japheth did, not necessarily to him, but for him. What do you do if you find your father naked? Okay. Ham goes out and he tells his other two brothers. If we've got the, the order of birth correctly, then Shem would be the oldest. He's the heir apparent to whatever Noah has. Then Ham would have been second in line. He would have been the one to step up and to take care of things if Shem was not able to take care of them. And then you've got Japheth, who's the baby boy. If that's the right order, then basically what happens is the son who should have been a protector of his father ends up playing the part of the baby he finds out that his father is naked and he immediately goes and tells his two brothers. So you have Shem and Japheth who then band together and get a garment and walk backwards and cover up their father's nakedness, never ever looking at him in his nakedness. Now I realize that in our culture, nakedness is somewhat uh, taboo, but in family groups, we're less stringent about it. And among males in family groups, we're even less stringent than that, right? So the idea that uh, if I had a son and he saw me naked would be a real problem is, is a little foreign from the way we think. But understand what we're looking at is an ancient family whose father was the absolute ruler of the family. He was the, the one who was absolutely in charge. That's how you can have Noah and his three sons and their three wives all get on the boat. Right? There's no question whether Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives are getting on the boat. Right? Noah is the head of the family. All of the family is doing what Noah does. All of the family is represented in Noah and what Noah does. Right? So when Noah drinks the wine and gets inebriated, takes off his clothes, lays down in his tent, right? he's not on the town square, he's in his tent. And Ham goes to see his father and finds him naked. What should Ham do? He should honor the place of his father. He should make sure that his father's honor, his father's dignity, his father's authority is sustained. What he does instead 
is go and tell his brothers what he has seen. And we get from the text that it's not an innocent telling, but a telling that says, hey, guess what I saw? Don't you want to go look? So he, he uncovers his father's dignity and invites his brothers to join him in doing that. Japheth and Shem decide against that and do something to honor Noah instead. They cover him up. If, if this guy I've been reading has it right, here's his scenario. Verse 24, the place in the family that should have or was already occupied by Ham is now moved down. So whereas Japheth would have been the youngest and the servant of everybody, he moves up a notch in the family ladder because he acted as one should act in giving reverence and giving respect to his father. Ham moves down the ladder because Ham acted in a way that was disrespectful to his father. He doesn't get kicked out of the family, but he does get lowered in his place of honor within the family. So when Noah dies at the end of the chapter, one would assume that Shem inherits the lion's share. Uh, typically, by the time we get to Jesus' day, and I'm not sure going back how far we could, could prove this, but by Jesus' day, if you were the eldest son, you inherited twice. So uh, basically, you were in charge of the family now, and twice as much as anybody else got in the the inheritance you got. So you're, you're the new large and in charge when daddy dies. Uh, Shem would have taken that. Uh, Japheth would have followed him and would have lived in his tents. He would have been a welcome guest in Shem's uh, uh, housing uh, under his authority. And then you have uh, Ham who would have been kind of the ostracized servant of all. Here comes the problem. Noah never curses Ham. There is no curse of Ham. Noah curses Canaan. And when you first get introduced to this section, you know something's coming because we've always had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, we get to verse uh, 18. Uh, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then you get that parenthesis. Ham was the father of Canaan. Right? Something's coming. Uh, all of a sudden we've got a grandkid. It may be that he's already been born just after the ark uh, docked. It may be that we're looking into the future for Canaan. Uh, you go on down a couple of verses and we get Ham mentioned again and he is not just Ham anymore. He is Ham who is the father of Canaan. Right? So we get it twice in rapid succession that Ham is not just a son of Noah anymore. Now he is the father of Canaan. What do we know about Canaan? Well, you have a group of people in the desert who have just come up out of Egypt. They're living in the desert. They're getting the law from God. They're following a guy named Moses. They're getting to know, get used to all these things. Where are they going? They're going to Canaan. When they get to Canaan, the question is going to be, who owns this property? Now, Abraham lived there. He never owned Canaan. He was a nomad. Isaac lived there. He never owned Canaan. He was a nomad. Jacob lived there. He never owned it. He was a nomad. They were all rich, but they were not the people who were from there. They were always the outsiders who had moved in. When God gets Israel to the border of Canaan, when he gets them back to the Jordan River and they cross the Jordan River, what's the order supposed to be? Shem owns it. Japheth is invited to be part of it, and Canaan is supposed to be the servant. When they get to Canaan, who owns it? Canaan, right? The descendants of Ham are in the, in the ascendancy. They own the thing. And so when you start asking the question about how did the children of Israel reconcile the idea that we're going to go into Canaan and it all belongs to us and God gave it to us, it's our property, we're going to displace all of these people, and they're either going to be our servants or we're going to kill them. Well, at the foot of the mountain, they get their first taste. Right? And again, he doesn't curse Ham. He curses Canaan. So by the time you get to Canaan, uh, they already have a, a taste of who this guy is. 
Uh, when you get into chapter 10, there are three greatest bad boys, I guess, in Israeli history, in, in the, the people that they fought against. First of all was the Canaanites. Then after a few centuries, they had to deal with the Assyrians who came in and conquered the northern ten tribes. And then eventually in about 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and conquered the rest of everybody. Right? Now, we're going to skip over Japheth. We're not going to be too interested in his offspring. But go down to about verse 6 of chapter 10. And we run into the offspring of Ham, right? the Hamites. <clears throat> the sons of Ham were Cush, Misraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sapta, Ra'amah, and Septicah. The sons of Ra'amah were Sheba and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. At the time that they received this, when they were at Mount Sinai, everybody would have gone, oh, that's where that saying came from. In our day, we go, never heard that in my life. But, you know, like Nimrod, the, the mighty hunter before the Lord, was a saying in their day. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. We're going to go to Shinar here in a minute. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kalah, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kalah. That is the great city. Mithraim was the father of the Ludites, the Anamites, the Lebedites, the Naphtahites. See, if you just read it like you know what you're saying, then people don't know the difference. Uh, <laughs> Pathrocytes, uh, Caslahites. <laughs> Did you say termites? <laughs> Somebody did. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn. And then listen to this. The, Hitt the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Gergesites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zimmerites, and Hamathites. Half of those names, especially the ites, all of those ites are ones that you run into when the Israelites get back to Canaan. The people they fight against, this is the list. And they conquer all of these nations that are inhabiting the land that God is giving to them. Later, the Canaanite clans scattered and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon all the way to Gerar and as far as Gaza and then toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim and as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. So when you read the list of the offspring of Ham, you run into all of those folks that the Israelites are going to run into when they get across the Jordan River. So early on at Mount Sinai, God is already telling them, right? When you get there, you're going to get resistance from folks who think they're the boss, but they're really the slaves, right? They're the ones that Noah cursed back in the day, and you're going to be the ones to come in and take away what they think belongs to them. Uh, and by the way, the difference in uh, dialect, the difference in skin color would have been very slight between the folks who were coming in, the descendants of Shem, and the folks who were inhabiting Canaan, the descendants of Ham. It would have been very, very small differences in body type and in coloration and all those kinds of things. So whatever you've heard about the curse of Ham, just throw that out. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the curse of Canaan. It's just uh, some things that folks have dreamed up to kind of rally their own uh, processes. All right. Um, the problem that the Canaanites run into, and we're jumping way ahead, the problem that the Canaanites run into is when they get there, they don't subjugate the Hamites. They intermarry with them. And as time goes by, they begin to worship their gods. And... Eventually, God punishes them by bringing on folks from Assyria, one of Nimrod's cities, and folks from Babylon, another one of Nimrod's cities. So the clash between the descendants of Ham and the descendants of Seth all begins very, very early. They're separated for a long period of time, 
but eventually those things come back together. All right, now let's go over to chapter 11, and I, th I think we are actually going to get out of this section. And if you have questions about any of this, uh, I realize that on Sunday nights we don't do a lot of question and answer, but grab me after worship. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Send me an email, send me a text, call me up, whatever. I love to talk about this stuff, and if there's something I'm missing that you're picking up on, I would love to hear what you have discovered. Genesis 11, beginning in verse 1. So the whole world had one language and common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Which group was most known for moving toward Babylon and Shinar? The Ham group, right? So men moved there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks. We'll bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches into the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel, because the, there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Uh, now, whether that is an immediate, uh, you know, beam me up Scotty kind of moment where this people group suddenly were in South America, or whether that is just the gradual uh, migration that we see in the textbooks, I can't tell you. Just know that their languages being different, they could no longer easily work together. And so they separated out and were moved to different places. Uh, a couple of interesting things in this passage to me. Uh, God examines the situation. We have a God in the first part of uh, Genesis and, and to a degree in the rest of Genesis that checks things out personally. Right? He creates, he does... Uh, an inspection. You know, he, he creates and he looks at it and he says it's good. Right? He finishes his creation he says it's very good. He hears reports about the way the world is and it's the world, all of their inclinations are only evil all the time. I'm going to have to do something about this. I can't let Adam go back into the, the uh, garden or he'll eat the fruit and live forever. Uh, so now that he knows good and evil we have to put a period here. We have to stop him from doing what he's thinking about doing. Well, now you get to the plains of Shinar, and God goes down and takes a look. And his response is, they're right. If I leave them alone, they're going to be able to do anything they want. Now, let me throw this at you. Uh, there is a new device. I don't guess it's as new anymore. But it is real-time interpretation so that you can take this little gadget in your hand, one of the most difficult languages for people from uh, Anglo backgrounds to speak is Chinese. You can walk into the street in China, you can speak into this little thing, push the button, it speaks perfect Chinese, and within seconds you can have a conversation that 20 years ago you weren't having. So all of a sudden man can do all kinds of things that man couldn't do 20 years ago. Let me ask you the question, is there anything that man can't get done? Just wait and watch. If the world stands, if the Lord lets us keep going, there's going to be some amazing things come out in the next few years. Uh, it's it's a, an interesting time to be alive. One of the big discussions right now is can we get an uh, inoculation for covid well, it should take about four or five years. No, it's going to take about six months, right? They're already in stage three trials. How do you do that? Well, you do that with people all over the world who can talk to each other, scientists everywhere who can communicate and say, here's what we've got in Russia, here's what we've got in Germany, here's what we've got in the United States, here's what we've got in Great Britain. We tweaked it this way, you tweak it that way. What are you guys coming up with? The competition level is amazing among these companies. But when people work together and can communicate with each other, it's extraordinary what human beings can do. 
But at this point in history, God says, I'm not having it. I don't want them to be able to continue doing this because the thing that they're doing is very self-serving. There were two things that this group wanted to accomplish by building this giant, what was probably something like a step pyramid, this giant thing. The, the base of the thing was probably several hundred yards wide, uh, and then they were going to step pyramid the thing up into the heavens. The two reasons that are given in the text, we want to make a name for ourselves, and we don't want to be scattered. And God says, we'll tell you what. <laughs> Neither of the two. You're not going to make a name for yourself. I'm the one that's in charge here. And you're not going to be kept from scattering. And he changed their languages and they scattered throughout the world. And he says that's the reason that the place was called Babel. Right? Because of confusion. That's what the word means. Babel just means confusion. Through the rest of scripture, you will not find a reference to Babylon that's good. Babylon is always bad. Uh, Babylon is the enemy of God from uh, the time of the Old Testament all the way into the book of Revelation. Right? The, uh, the enemy of God in Revelation keeps coming up as Babylon the Great, the, the uh, mother of all harlots, right? Babylon. It's always bad. What does it represent? Well, at the very least, it represents mankind saying, we want to be in charge of us. We don't want God to tell us what to do. We think we can do whatever we want to do if we just work together. And God says, yeah, that's, that may be true, but it's not right. And so he stopped them from being able to move away from him by stopping them from being able to communicate and work with each other. So that's what I come up with from the text. Um, it, it's got a lot of lessons I think that we can learn about if you go back to Noah and his son. Uh, the way we should treat those who come before us, the level of respect that we should have for our elders. Ham did not. Uh, we should not follow Ham's example, but we should follow Sham and Japheth, who said we're going to find a way to make sure that our parent has the kind of dignity and respect that they deserve, whether that has to do with day-to-day -day living, whether that has to do with end-of-life questions. We should be interested in making sure that those who have gone before us have the kind of dignity that they deserve as the heads of our family. Uh, you can think about the, the kind of conflicts that people have when they don't put God first. When we have people in our world who say, well, here's what we really want. We say, yeah, but scripture says this. And they say, yeah, but look at how much we could accomplish if we go this direction instead of God's direction. And you say, yeah, well, that's true. But it's not right. So there's lots of lessons even from this extremely ancient document that we can learn. Now, Lord willing, we have made our way out of ancient history and are ready to get with Abraham. And then we're in a little bit more familiar territory. A few less we don't knows and a few more this is what God had to say. So keep that in mind, Lord willing. Uh, we'll get to that next week.